NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union and is a public media North Carolina production in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government. I'm standing here in lovely Shelby. We're holding a town hall meeting that will take a look at how cultural resources like this center can actually enhance and promote economic development in an entire region. This is NC Impact. This region's rich assets encourage visitors here from all over the world. Through partnerships among its communities, rural and urban, this community has determined to focus on what makes it unique. Let's take a look at the impact of how one region coming together to define itself based on its cultural assets had made, has made all the difference in the world for its economy. So here at the Earl Scruggs Center, it is not uncommon to see people from different states on any given day. And so when they're coming here, they're not only coming to see the center, but once they're here, they realize we have an incredibly vibrant Uptown Shelby. And so they stay around and they go shop in the shops and they eat in our restaurants. And, and they're starting to realize that Cleveland County, that Uptown Shelby is, is an incredible destination to come spend time, not only because you have these two cultural assets, the Don Gibson Theater and the Earl Scruggs Center, because there are other things to do as Welcome, well. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the downtown Waynesville Street Dance. Glad to have you. We are a stop on the Blue Ridge Music Trail. We're very fortunate to be a stop on that music trail, and it's because of the, the musical heritage here in Cleveland County. Blue Ridge Music Trails is a way to bring state, national, and international attention to the musicians and music venues of 28 counties in Western North Carolina. It connects places where music bubbles up in the community. It describes those places and the musicians who play there uh, and invites people to come and participate in the music that's played. People are hearing about it and then that gives them, you know, some curiosity about, well, gosh, maybe I should check this out. And when they find out about it, then they find enough reason to come visit. There are many opportunities, I think, for these uh, rural communities to identify what is unique about their community. And from that uniqueness, identify a strategy that connects them to that urban market. And in the process of connecting themselves to that urban market, I think it also opens them up to larger audiences, national audiences, and even global audiences. There is no way that a community this size with the limited resources, both in people as well as you know, the financial aspect of it, the creativity that it takes, the things that have happened here, I don't see how they could have happened without that collaboration, without the champions that rose up. And whether that was volunteers or community leaders in city roles, county roles, it, it's, absolutely been crucial to the success of what's happened here. You might think that we want to compete with these other communities, but everyone has their own unique, authentic asset. And I really feel like here in Cleveland County, we've figured that out. You know, music as our heritage, um, as a really important part of the fiber of our community. And so it's always great to talk with other people who are doing similar things to get ideas, to share our experience, what we've done, what's helped us to be successful. I am delighted to be joined by David Deer, co-owner of Newgrass Brewing and former county manager of Cleveland County, Melanie Graham, 
member of the board of directors of Destination Cleveland County, and owner of two bed and breakfasts, one here in Shelby and the other in Belmont, and Jeff Michaels, director of the Urban Institute at UNC Charlotte. Thank you all for joining me. So we're gonna have a conversation about why place matters and how that develops a sense of authentic being for a region. And I wanna start with you, Jeff. We spend a lot of time in North Carolina, maybe across the country, talking about rural-urban divides. Tonight I wanna to talk about rural-urban connections, and in particular, how the connective tissue of this region has helped to build not only a social fabric, not only an identity, but also an economy. Yeah. You know, that connection and, and uh, relationship between urban and rural here in North Carolina really goes back many centuries even from the earliest, earliest settlement patterns, but particularly in the 20th century with the rise of you know, the traditional economic sectors that we identify with North Carolina, textiles, tobacco, furniture, you know, those industries didn't grow up in urban areas alone. Instead, they grew up on the backs, really, of small communities like Shelby, like my hometown in Albemarle. And many of the cities that we associate with urban North Carolina today, Charlotte, uh, Greensboro, Raleigh, Durham, you know, really became the cities that they are because of those more traditional legacy industries uh, here in North Carolina. But the question we've been asking ourselves, and we've been able to do so with the support from the Duke Endowment for this project at the Institute we've been working on for two years called the Carolina's Urban Rural Connection Project, is to really ask the question, you know, well, as those urban areas have really built upon that initial foundation and, and uh, placed themselves as players on the national and even global stage, what is the role, what is the opportunity in these rural communities? And as you said, we really believe from the two years of research that we've done that that opportunity rests on the authenticity of these communities and the unique assets they have, whether it's the musical heritage in a place like Shelby, outdoor recreation opportunities that abound throughout this region, uh, the historic fabric. And, and so uh, I can't think of a, a better poster child for that than Shelby and what they have done here with their musical heritage. And of course, that future and the success of those uh, sectors really depend on their ability to tap into those urban markets. So, David, let me turn to you for a second, because obviously one of the barriers to regionalism is the reality of arbitrary lines that divide counties, divide municipalities from counties, et cetera. You served as a, the county manager here in Cleveland County. Tell us a little bit about what you did to facilitate work across those lines. Actually, it's, it's pretty amazing what you can uh, do as far as working together, how quickly you can learn to work together when you're in a crisis situation. And basically, that's what we were when all of this came about. We had an unemployment rate of about 16.5%. About half of our storefronts here in Uptown Shelby were vacant. And uh, fortunately, at that point in time, we had some excellent uh, leaders on the county commission level. We had some great leaders on city council. We had a very, very good young city manager here in Shelby. And uh, we were able to learn very quickly that we needed to work together. We had to work together in order to make this uh, situation better. So uh, I want to go back to you for a second, Jeff, because you've been doing this research on urban rural connections. And I hear from David two ingredients at least. One is, it helps to have a crisis. And certainly here in North Carolina and those traditional sectors, we've had a crisis. And, and the other is, a little bit of youth never hurt Not in at innovation. All. Not at all. Is that what you're finding in your research? Well, I, we're finding a lot of things, and David talked about leadership, and clearly that has emerged as one of the uh, top issues that we keep hearing time and time again, that the places that are doing the best in rural North Carolina and small towns are those places that have identified that leadership and given it an opportunity to invest uh, not only their resources, but their talents. And you know, I, I think this question about youth also raises the question about inclusivity. Uh, many of these communities uh, have struggled in part because they've been 
perhaps unwilling to invite newcomers with fresh ideas. And I think places like Shelby have recognized that really to be successful, you have to be open to new voices, new ideas. And, and that's tied to the question of leadership. So Melanie, let's bring you into this conversation. What motivated you to invest in a business here in Shelby? What was the call? Well, the calling um, for me um, occurred probably about 15 years before I even found Shelby, um, just as a, an entrepreneur and a person that had possessed the skills to do a business and a work of hospitality. And um, so it was kind of already in me. I was just looking for a Petri dish to land so that I could grow. And at first, I wasn't convinced that it actually would be Shelby. I started off uh, down in New Bern and looking at other particular areas. And you know, one of the challenges uh, with selecting Shelby is that um, it's not Charlotte. It's not you know, urban. But what I found it to be was friendly and cooperative and even more importantly, collaborative. So we've heard that we need to be inclusive, embracing, collaborative. This is a friendly place. Let's, let's dissect what it takes to build this Petri dish for a second. We'll start with you, David. We're going Science 101 mm -hmm. on this panel. What was the first major intergovernmental collaboration that caused you to say, not just Shelby's going to make it, but this region is going to come behind this work. I think the very first thing that, that happened, again, going back to our very high unemployment rate that, that we had here in the county, um, there weren't any developers of, of any significance here in our area, like there are in Charlotte, that would um, develop property in order to bring new folks back into town. So we we decided very early on that we had to do that ourselves. So we got together with the city and the city and the county collectively bought a couple hundred acres of land, developed it into an industrial park, uh, built a couple shell buildings in that park, and we were successful in, in doing that. And success begets success. Mm. And so that was the beginning, and it, it actually made this piece of it a little easier as we went forward. So you started with traditional economic development. We did. When did you get this idea that you were going to build upon the cultural assets of this community, music, the arts? Well, I think shortly after we had those, those couple successes, we um, came upon the fact that this building was, was vacant. It was a historic museum uh, at that point in time. And, and we're sitting in the Earl Scruggs we're, we're Center. We're sitting in the Earl yes. Scruggs Center in Shelby, North Carolina, which was uh, the original Cleveland County Courthouse built in 1907. Uh, it housed the historical museum. Uh, the museum itself went defunct. The building was uh, getting in a state of disrepair. And not only did we need to figure out something pretty quickly about what we were going to do with this building, but we needed to figure out something to be able to bring traffic back to Uptown Shelby so we could make the business district viable again. Melanie, so you've got these two enterprises, one in Belmont, one in Shelby. Tell me how you see this idea of regional connectivity. Well, for me, um, I find it very easy um, to draw from both of the regional, you know, like areas as far as business is concerned. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to sit on both of the uh, Board of Tourism. So for me, I have the opportunity to hear ideas and, you know, I comment is through his marketing and the importance of really creating what I call a, um, an experience. Um, and so I'd sit on both of them and then create the experience and then I'm able to basically implement those changes as well as providing a quality service um, and uh, for all of the visitors and you know, like tourists that actually come. So it's, it's a very, um, I, I guess, palatable and easy um, type of opportunity for me. So I've read recently that it, since 2009, this 
Nigeria has had visitors literally from all over the world and certainly from all 50 states. Jeff, Charlotte, 50 miles away. How often do people Boy. from Charlotte make it to Shelby? You know, it's interesting. I think if you had asked that question 10 years ago, probably very few people would say they have come to Shelby, or if they had, they had only passed through on their way to the mountains of North Carolina. But as we started doing this research and, and began talking not only to people in places like Shelby, but in Charlotte itself, we started hearing stories about people because of uh, amenities like the Earl Scruggs Center and the Don Gibson Theater, that they were beginning to stop off, not just at Red Bridges Barbecue, uh, but also to downtown Shelby. Uh, to experience those cultural attractions. And I think it's that sense of place, that authenticity that people are looking for, that our region has uh, so much to offer. The area of local foods and food systems, you know, people are, are hungry for, pardon the pun, but you know, they're, they're longing for that local connection to we'll food systems. We'll take hungry for food, we'll that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's very good. So, so you know, I think, and that was really at the heart of our project with the Carolinas Urban Rural Connection Project. You know, nationally, there's so much discussion about the urban rural divide, culturally, politically, and you know, certainly that's there, but I think it all begins with the breakdown of the, the traditional economic ties. And our, our thinking and our theory behind this project was that if we can rebuild those economic ties, we can begin to rebuild those cultural and political relationships as well. And uh, I think the communities around Charlotte are in a unique position compared to rural communities in the Midwest, for example, or other places that the nearest urban area may be two hours away. But here, as you pointed out, we're only 40 to 50 miles from Charlotte. And so I think there's some real opportunities for these rural communities, and that's what we've been trying to explore. So you said success begets success, and you know, David, when you look in the rear view mirror, boy, that vision is always about 2020, right? How much of this rural urban connection were you really focused on when you were county manager and working through these challenges? This is your chance to be honest and to say, look, we had 60% unemployment, I was just trying to get people some jobs. <laughs> Well, that, that, was, that was a part of it, but we also had uh, a history of, of division here in Cleveland County. We had three school systems, two city school systems, one county school systems. We went through a very ugly merger process, which I think kind of brought uh, urban and rural uh, together a little bit and kind of set the stage for us working together uh, with the municipalities in the county. Wow. And so Melody is a newcomer. You're the beneficiary of That's absolutely that, correct. that yes. hard work. Yes. What would you say the work looks like ahead? Well, the work ahead um, for me is just to get in and find a real place to forge, you know, ahead with all of the other, you know, like persons that have started the work. And I guess that's one of the reasons why when I really began to understand the synergy and people were talking about what they wanted Shelby to be and, you know, it was just so energetic and vibe, I would, you know, kind of really resonate with it. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'll create this great great, you know, like lodging um, opportunity and experience. We'll have the best food. We'll have the best spa services. You know, we'll just make Wait, them. Wait, we talked about spa <laughs> services oh, yet. I'm sorry. Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> Rewind. You didn't get Say that. more. <laughs> So, so yes, and, and you know, the, the experience that we create inside the bed and breakfast really occurs at the breakfast table because you have those people from all walks of life and, you know, and more and more from Charlotte that begin dialoguing and we really begin to realize we're not different at all. There's more similarities than differences. So that traveler, you know, like from Amsterdam, um, I have someone from the UK that is there now. And so, you know, there's just that great um, bonding. And basically, we're creating memories. Well, all of this, of course, is why Jeff refers to you all as the poster child. Um, and I have read that you are the poster child for creative placemaking. I wonder if each of you could just say what those words mean to you. And we'll start with you, David. 
think it's just building on our heritage, uh, the heritage that we had uh, of music. Uh, even making alcohol is, is part of the heritage uh, in the mountain areas. <laughs> that, that could make for some place making, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think we've just, we've just built on our heritage that, that we've had here. And uh, the community has embraced that. And we've had a lot of great volunteers that have really made uh, this place making happen. Thank you. For me, it would be the continuation of Southern hospitality. Um, I travel quite a bit for work, and I know when I come back into my region, because there's a smile, somebody's holding the door for me, somebody is actually speaking to me that does not know me. And so that's exactly what guests tell me they experienced. They said, I, you know, I went into you know, some of the local restaurants and the brewery, and people were talking to me like I lived there. And so we continue to, um, to really embrace that Southern moment. And, and I you know, just think it's important that we hold on to that. Uh, love that. Jeff? Well, I don't know that I have anything original to add after David and Melanie, but you know, I think that sense of authenticity, as I said earlier, is what many people are looking for. Uh, Charlotte, going back to the urban-rural connection, Charlotte is no longer just competing with Birmingham and Richmond and other places for jobs. It's competing with Portland and Denver and, and other places that have extraordinary natural resources, cultural resources. And uh, unfortunately, in Charlotte, we've lost so much of the original historic fabric. But you don't have to go far outside of Charlotte to find that. And I think to take it another step, and I, I really love what you said about gathering around the, the dinner table, the breakfast table, the bed and breakfast, and creating authentic relationships and conversations. And really, that's what our project's all about. It's, it's hoping through these economic connections and doing so through a creative place-making strategy that you're also beginning to develop authentic relationships that I think help us all move forward in a way that's positive for society. So that, that's what really gets me excited about creative place-making. Well, it's totally fascinating, in part because when we usually think about authentic relationships, we think about them at the micro level, right? I love the metaphor of the dinner table because that's really what we think about. It's, it's about family, it's about close neighbors. And yet what I hear you saying, Jeff, is your research suggests that the neighborhood is a pretty large one Absolutely. and spans many miles right. outside of this county and people are coming here for that sense of respite. Yeah, and, and you know, our work is, has led us to look at Raleigh and what's around Raleigh and around Greensboro. And I see the same opportunities there of uh, building upon what's authentic of, uh, in the communities around those urban centers as well as that opportunity to build stronger relationships. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how this is the reverse. We often think about people going from um, less metropolitan areas into metropolitan areas for culture. How cool is it that people are coming from metropolitan areas here to get the culture they can't get there? I want to open things up now for some questions from the audience. We've got about five minutes. Hi, first of all, thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it very much. We've done a great job of placemaking and building on our cultural heritage and so forth, but like a lot of smaller rural communities, we still struggle with a lot of health-related issues in Cleveland County in terms of uh, just down, you know, we're in the lower spectrum of, of health out, healthy outcomes in the state of North Carolina. I'm just wondering your thoughts on how we can take this momentum of placemaking place uh, and build on that to create healthier communities where people want to not only visit but also come and live and, and raise a family. That's one of the challenges of facing a lot of rural communities and just wondering your thoughts about that. So, Melanie, I wonder if I might ask you to take that. For, we've I been talking a lot about attracting visitors, but ultimately, placemaking is about creating homes. How do you make this a place where people want to come and live and raise their families and know that they will be amongst a healthy population? 
Well, I, I want to take it, if I may, from, from two aspects. I want to address it from the, the health aspect and, and wellness. So one of the things that I find that's important is that there's a lot of um, new and emerging types of um, ways to make people healthier. And, and relaxation and rest and mindfulness and those type of things are all, you know, like part of that. When you um, look at it from a standpoint of how do we, how do we house these people well, I have found Shelby to have the best housing stock that is untapped um, in, the, in the city. Uh, and maybe it's just that because I'm a preservationist and I really love historic um, homes that when I'm out driving, I see a lot of opportunity mm. there um, for things that are already existing that could you know, be revitalized and brought into you know, some other higher and better purpose and use. So that would kind of be my suggestion. Uh, and let me just say that even for an institution, having a historic home, it's um, sometimes challenging to retrofit that to you know, comply Absolutely. with everyone. But I sure make it my business to try. David, any thoughts on the health? Well, side of, of things. One of the things that we have tried to do in our business is use local products, uh, local foods, a farm to table type atmosphere and, and try and not use so many foods that have preservatives that seem to cause health issues. So that, that's one way we're trying to address it. And of course all of this feels very consistent with the brand of the region, right? Which is go with what is yours. Um, and build from there rather than thinking necessarily just about what the rest of us know as sick care. You're thinking about health in a very holistic way. Thank you. At one point, the future looked bleak for Shelby as businesses boarded up and the local economy seemed to be decaying. But a group of citizens branded as Destination Cleveland County, breathe new life into their community. Let's take a look at the impact of the, how this new group focused on two anchor projects to help bring economic vitality back to town. All the beer that we serve is made right back here. I was born and raised in Shelby. I, I grew up here, uh, went off to school in Raleigh and uh, moved back here to raise a family. And when we moved back to Shelby in uh, 1979, you could ride down the street on a Friday or Saturday night and you were lucky to see another car. When we took a good look at the town, we realized there were so many ab abandoned buildings. There was hardly anyone on the streets. So we started out with a 30-person task force in, in February of 2006. We knew we were poor, we knew we needed to bring some industry in, and we brought in the tourism industry. Some of the artists uh, that have been at the Don Gibson Theater. I think as we talked to folks that was in the business, everywhere we went, and they said, what is your, down, what is your attraction? What's gonna cause people to come? And we said, well, we've got Earl Scruggs and we got Don Gibson, and they, everybody, oh man, if we had those names. And so we, we there's no doubt we use those names and still do today to attract and try to draw people downtown. You know, in our case, it's just Don. You know, Don was a regular guy and he was um, a regular person, but to the world, Don Gibson was um, a superstar. You know, um, he was a um, singer-songwriter that had some of the biggest hits in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. As people see that and people you know, outside of the county and outside of the state see that and they come to the theater to, to remember Don or, or at least experience a little bit about, you know, his legacy. And then Earl Scruggs he sort of changed the face of the banjo because of Earl and what he done with the banjo and caused other people to do with the banjo made bluegrass what it, what it turned out to be. Earl was the best banjo player in the world. We couldn't just have any kind of museum. We needed something that was first quality that would indeed draw the tourists to Cleveland County. CIP on both of these tanks. Once Destination Cleveland County was formed and Scrug Center opened Don Gibson, uh, then we had other businesses and restaurants that uh, took a chance on really 
uh, making a statement here in town and some people come in they say wow look at all the things that have happened in the last four or five years and I told him I said yeah it's been um, a 38 year overnight success story. Everybody don't you, don't you give up no. People are becoming exhausted with the hustle and bustle of the larger cities and so they're looking for a more quiet place to live but a place that also offers them a lot of things to do. And so I think that that's what's happening with Shelby. Like, we have a lot of companies and a lot of things going on uptown. More people are drawn here, um, hanging out, having fun, meeting like-minded people. Just, it's going to be amazing. In the next 10 years, Shelby is going to be, whew, like, <laughs> bigger than we ever thought it could be, I think. Part of my motivation was to uh, bring back the town that I grew up in, that I loved and I always have, uh, and to try to make this as attractive of a place as possible for people to come back to and to uh, start their own family. I am pleased to be joined by Audrey Wetton, the Executive Director of Uptown Shelby Association, Stan Anthony, the Mayor of the City of Shelby, and Brownie Plaster with Destination Cleveland County. Brownie, I'd like to start with you, if I might. So a 38-year overnight success. How'd you get here? I think that 38 years goes back to when the um, mall opened, and then we started seeing the decline of retail in the uptown. But as a citizen here, and I rep as sitting here, I represent 200 volunteers um, who just realized, with the help of Dr. David Jenkins from NC State, who came in, David Deere, our county manager at the time had hired him to come in and facilitate us about the failed museum and what to do with the artifacts that had remained. So the first thing he said to us is you have to talk about the entire town because it's dying and you will have tumbleweeds. So I think that the realization of that hit us hard. We had to look in the mirror. We had to go through the realization. We had to have the commitment and then we had to decide what we could do. So the research into the Don Gibson Earl Scruggs was really quite lengthy. We did travel trips, and as JT said in the uh, a movie, uh, people would say, don't look any further. They're so well known around the world. They're so sensational. And that was uh, interesting to, for us to join in that effort to celebrate those two. We, we could have celebrated a couple of governors from here, but we felt like we were after the heritage tourist, and the heritage, heritage tourist spends more time in a community, it spends more money, that's what we were after. We wanted people to come, a few people every week. We didn't want to have a festival that would last only three days. So we, we sought to bring the heritage tourist here. So commitment, we looked in the mirror, nobody was going to do it for us. We said we have to do it ourselves. So we started with 10, 20, and got up to two, 200 people. So 200 volunteers. 200 volunteers. And of course, we had to raise the money. Nobody was paying us to do that. So uh, as someone said, this volunteering sure is expensive because uh, <laughs> as leaders, as leaders uh, you have to make your commitment. You have to make your five-year pledge. You have to give your time. Uh, fortunately, uh, JT had retired from an international uh, business, Fortune 500 company, had many, many um, uh, frequent flyer miles, so we did travel, we did lots of travel, we've been to Oklahoma City, B.B. King in Indianola, Mississippi, uh, what, what did they do right that we could do here? So uh, we gave it all and we're all pleased. And then we had people that, that trusted us that we could indeed deliver. Uh, the product mm. and they invested and they held in throughout uh, the financial crisis of 08, 09. That was, that was very difficult for us, but we made it. But you made it through. We made it. Mm -hmm. So, Mayor Stan. I... Shelby, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is a mayor's dream. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So let's talk about a mayor's nightmare for a second. I suspect that if I were to poll 100 random mayors to say there's going to be a group of 200 grassroots organizers who want to work with you on economic development, they would wrap their heads in pain. Tell me, what has your relationship been like with 
people like Brownie, who I understand is described as a force of nature. <laughs> she is definitely that. Now, we are very blessed here. Our community, uh, as David Deere touched on in your earlier segment about uh, collaboration, uh, that's really what we're about in, in the city. As Destination Cleveland Canyon was getting started back in the mid-2000s, uh, the city was right there to step forward and help and offer assistance. So there really was never any kind of uh, friction or, you know, the, the private sectors. Never, ever. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm do doing my mayor thing too much here. But no, it was, uh, uh, I mean, there, certainly there were differences, but... Shelby and Cleveland County really has worked collaboratively extremely well. In fact, when I go around the state talk to folks, they're amazed at how well our collaboration here amongst our, our city and county government, also with the private sector, and particularly with leaders like uh, Brown, who really is a force in our community. The other thing I'd like to mention that David Deere touched on was the uh, uh, collaboration with the city. And I want to give a shout out to our city manager because when our city manager, Rick Howell, came to town in, in the mid-2000s, it was when all this was getting started. And so Rick's youthful energy and, and desire to really make an impact helped a lot in that collaboration moving forward with Destination Cleveland County. That's great. Thank you. Audrey, in the last panel, I wanted to try to situate Shelby within the region and point out how the benefits of Shelby Ridge really are regional benefits. But in this panel, I want to go deep into the city of Shelby itself. Tell me why, as a young professional, you wanted to locate here, and talk to me about creative placemaking within the boundaries of the Mayor's City. So I had never heard of Shelby. And I, um, actually, that's not true. I had heard of it uh, from a young person, and they told me not to ever come here. And that was, I was in high school. and. Um, I've had a talk with his mom since then. <laughs> but um, I discovered the job and um, knew of um, the person who recommended it to me. I trusted her completely. And she said, Audrey, Shelby has a history in Main Street like no other. And where did you come from? I moved from Clinton, North Carolina. But I'm from Raleigh originally. Okay. And. Um, what drew me here, in addition to the long history of Main Street, which is the work that I do, downtown development, um, this sense of community and ownership and resilience and a spirit for tackling hard things and collaborative um, work and people being all in. So it's real. The it mayor's not just selling me a bill of goods. <laughs> He's not. OK, all right. <laughs> not that I didn't trust you, Mayor, I'm just saying. <laughs> No, it, re it really is true. The, I, I've worked in a number of towns in North Carolina, small rural towns. And um, in a number of those places, there was a sense of either you're not from here, and we don't really want you here, and we don't want your ideas, um, or we do want your ideas, and we want you to do it for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to work for it ourselves. And um, I finally told some people, this is your town. It's not my town. And um, if you don't want things to happen, I can't help you with that, changing that mindset. So when I interviewed here in Shelby, um, I was blown away by the, by the work of all the business owners, the community leaders in both um, local government as well as the nonprofit sector, places like Destination Cleveland County, and the work that people were doing to say, you know what, we want this to happen, and we're going to make it happen. And I said, this is my town, <laughs> and I, I want to be a part of this. So that ties in completely with the placemaking question. And um, our organization is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we, as a Main Street organization, we cover a broad range. We do events, we do marketing, we do business development, community partnerships. And in the midst of all that, there are placemaking initiatives like public art, whether it's murals or a sculpture, um, we also work with historic preservation, some of our building owners, to redevelop their properties. And um, that sense of uniqueness and authenticity that was touched on in the first panel, preservation is key in that. And um, some of our events as well, we have Seeds in Season, which is a farm-to-table fundraiser that we host that celebrates local farms and local chefs, local artists, and all of our different um, 
efforts to plug local music throughout on the sidewalks, throughout our art walks and other micro events like our second Saturdays. Um, we also partner with other people in the community on their placemaking efforts and um, projects like the Farmer's Market, New Grass Brewing Company, um, Boy Scouts revamping alleys and adding art, any number of things, all these little tiny projects that even if it's not groundbreaking, it's not the silver bullet to um, take Shelby to the national stage, it adds something special for people to discover here. And it, um, I know for me, I'm not from here, but it makes it feel special and it makes it feel like my own. Wow, that's a lot. Let's dissect some of that if we can. So Brownie, Audrey has talked about building on and holding on to and preserving all that makes this city special, makes it unique. And yet building an economy is also about the next thing. So how are you balancing those two tensions as you move forward? Well, I think as we developed particularly the Earl Scruggs Center, we said that this um, place would tell the story, Earl's story, and the place that gave birth to his music. So we intentionally did oral histories in four threads that we continued. The music thread, which was obvious, the textile thread, uh, the untold African-American story thread, and then the 21st century thread, who we are, who we want to be. So a person can visit here, plug into various voices that we have, go on our website, listen to these voices, and understand where we are. So hopefully when someone knows where they came from, that they will go forward together. And we learned early on that when all knees are under the table and there's collaboration and openness and dialogue, that we could do great things together. So I think that spirit of openness continues. Uh, we always say, come join the fun. Uh, you're welcome to be with us. Uh, we also um, did a great deal of collaboration as we traveled around the county and we had five different locations throughout the county where we had input and we asked people, what's important to you? What, do you, what traditions do you want to carry into the future? What kind of place do you want this to be? So I do think that we did do a lot of groundwork that's, that is really um, seeing us in good stead now and that we can only launch into the future and we build relationships with partnerships such as the Blue Ridge Music Trails that I think was referred to in the film. Um, uh, our executive director goes to the League of Historic American Cities uh, national conferences to have the latest in those things. So we advertise nationally when we can raise the money. Uh, it's very expensive to take a full page ad in a national magazine. Anybody want to give us $10,000? <laughs> we'll be glad to take it. Um, we will pass the hat at the so, end of this yes, table. We will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we are continuing. Um, and I think we learned early. The first concert, Earl came home to uh, uh, help us promote the idea. And someone called that morning and said, OK, I'm here. I'm from Ohio. And I went, you're what? They, he really came. He said, what else is there to do? We said, we have a wonderful arts council. We have a wonderful art gallery with uh, uh, 18 artists across the street. We have this, we have that. They were having a quilt show, which is a biennial thing. Well, by the time they got to the high school that night, they were blown away. Huh. But they came. We said, this, this unique place, which is the center of our town, our county, would draw, Earl's name would draw people here. And then we could send them out in the county. And I'm always a firm believer that a rising tide lifts all boats. So as we continue to go forward, we love seeing young people like Audrey move here. Our son, one of our sons moved back here. We love having uh, young people in our community. So, so it wasn't your son who told Audrey that she shouldn't move here? No, it was not. Yeah, no. No. Just checking, no, no, just no, no, checking. No, no, no. <laughs> so I love this idea of sort of the ripple effects. Mm -hmm. You've got mm -hmm. these anchor mm -hmm. institutions mm -hmm. and then lots mm -hmm. of stuff mm -hmm. is growing around it. Mayor, what if I asked you the same question? What, what's next for Shelby, and how do you balance the what's next with what you've done? 
Yeah, so I'm very excited about the fact that we've been branded around our music heritage. Uh, music is, it's incredible. You can go on a Friday night and walk the streets of Shelby and you see so many very talented mm -hmm. local musicians. Uh, I, I like to think that uh, because of these anchor uh, projects that we have here, these uh, Scruggs Center and the Don Gibson Theater, it's inspiring other musicians to come out in the public to play. and and. It's very exciting, and in, in the film that you showed just a minute ago, the, the young lady who has got a phenomenal recording studio just a block down the street here. Uh, I, I really believe that our, our musical heritage is something we can build on and will, and will happen uh, because there are so many talented musicians that I think will be the next Don Gibson or Earl Scruggs in the years to come. So. I'm available to audition if you'd like. I would just say, if you're going to be here, you might as well sing. Yeah. Well, well, and I have to, just as a point of personal privilege, my band actually rehearses in the building that she, she has her recording studio. And I can tell you, she has some phenomenal musicians. And it's really like the real building or Hitsville, USA, wow. just right here in downtown wow. Shelby. Mm -hmm. So it's not just our past, it's our pre present. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, uptown. <laughs> Stand corrected. <laughs> Uh, okay, well then I won't mess up the brand by singing. Forget that. <laughs> Audrey, talk to us a little bit about what creative placemaking means to her. And I wonder if I could just get you, Brownie, and Stan to articulate what it means to you. Okay, I'll go first. I think that for me it's to decide what is authentic. And I always tell people when they come here and say, how did you do this? I say, what is unique about you? Be creative in your thoughts. What makes your community unique? We all have good barbecue. We all have good people. We all have good schools. You know, just the list goes on. What is unique to you? So I think that using those resources is what creative placemaking is. And then realizing that tourism is economic development. I think that is something that quite often is lost in rural communities. Mm -hmm. is they think of economic development as being a big, big box employing 2,000 people, which we all know is, is not the, the rule of this day. Um, but economic development, think of what the arts do, whether it's, whether it's music, whether it's a, an arts council, a community theater, what they do. And then once we focus on one particular area, then it gives us all civic pride. And then we all become civic entrepreneurs because we do invest in our time, in our talent, in our community. So to me, that is creative placemaking. Well, I hope lots of viewers take that to heart because mm -hmm. it is so easy to watch the success of mm -hmm. some place mm -hmm. and go, ooh, gee, we can do that too mm -hmm. without really determining whether mm -hmm. the story you're trying to tell is a story that's yours to mm -hmm. tell. Exactly. So creative placemaking for me, at least as I think of it as it relates to Shelby, it is creating an environment, creating a, a place that, that artisans and people uh, are, feel very comfortable, that they do feel connected to the community, connected to each other. Uh, and I think we've done that here, and I think we, we continue to do that to where artisans and musicians, artists can, can, can feel like it is a place where they can express themselves through their art. Uh, and be accepted. And I think we have that kind of environment here that uh, I think that's one of the reasons, as I mentioned about the number of musicians here, is they do feel comfortable here. So I do think creative placemating means creating a place where artists feel comfortable and can be accepted. Thank you. Right, I'm going to open things up, if you don't mind, so that our audience has a chance to ask some questions. And I've got one right here. I first came to this area I'm going to say almost 50 years ago, so you know I'm not 32. And um, I learned some things today. So thank you very much, and thank you to the group who came beforehand. What has struck me when I've been here at the Earl Scruggs Center and also at the Don Gibson Theater is the importance of having, having openings and opportunities for young artists. Earl had to have some people reaching out and giving opportunities. And I wanted to ask your thoughts about what are the opportunities? I'd, I'd love to hear some concrete examples of what we're doing to nurture new talent who can extend our, our musical heritage. 
Okay, Terrific. I'll, I'll tackle a little bit of that. Um, cool. uh, at our theater, our business plan is to put national performing acts on our stage, our main stage. In the lounge, prior to the shows, we have local talent. So it's a way for the local groups to be there and let's say you have a Ricky Skaggs or a Marty Stewart or a Rodney Corral and they happen to listen to those people. That is a real huge uh, boost for those young people. Uh, they'll talk instruments, they'll talk uh, arrangements. Another thing the theater does is they have a singer-songwriter symposium every year and they bring in a Nashville um, noted uh, singer-songwriters to be the judges. We had many entries. We are in about fifth year of that. That's a wonderful way to encourage uh, young people to come. Here at the Scruggs Center, uh, we are starting to have more uh, younger groups to come in. And of course, we have our wonderful picking on the square in the summertime where people just come, come in to sit and pick. And the young people, I've seen eight-year-old boys come in with their banjo girls, come in with their banjos, and they might be sitting next to an 80-year-old, and they say, let me show you how to do this. That's the way Earl was. Earl always wanted to encourage people. So we have his spirit of encouraging the young people, which I think helps us to encourage those coming after us. Anybody else want to yeah, offer? I can't really add to that. I would just say some of the local uh, establishments, Newgrass, a good example, they have open mic, and uh -huh. you can go down there. Is it Roger Thursday nights, I believe it is, that people in the community can get out and play. So there's a lot of opportunities. Good. Other questions? While we're waiting, I'll jump in on that. Okay. Um, we have created an inventory of street musicians, buskers who are typically young musicians who um, don't have the network maybe to connect and get booked at the Don Gibson. And um, we reach out to them when we have an opportunity like an art walk or a second Saturday where we have funds to pay a musician to play. We always welcome street musicians, but sometimes it's helpful to kind of encourage that. And we do want to support our musicians um, by not always expecting them to play for free. So uh, we pay them and... Um, Infrequent flyer miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Or cash, but yeah. Cash um, is good. Yeah, and then encourage them to accept tips if, if that, they choose to do that. But um, that's been neat to see people start there and then move into some of the other open mics and sometimes getting booked in some of our venues. And the mayor talked about lots of young talent playing around on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, street music? And, and more of the bars and establishments okay. around the square here, yeah. Lots, lots of good musicians. Wonderful. Invite you back on a Friday night, by the way. Mm. I will definitely come back on a Friday night. And again, I promise I won't sing. <laughs> so, Brownie, this was your vision, right? You wanted year-round activity. We did. We did. And we, we wanted them to come. Because of the two years, I wanted to say that we researched these projects for two years. We did not just jump in. We're, I'm always a uh, aim ready fire person, not a fire ready aim. So we took two years, we educated ourselves on how to run museums, how to run theaters. None of us were museum people, none of us were theater people. And after two years of research, feasibility analyses, uh, audience research, um, strategic plans, we were able to uh, go forward. And then we had such cooperation from Chapel Hill, from the uh, Center for the Study of the American South. We couldn't have done without their help to help us understand that this was important. I remember Dr. Bill Ferris in 2007 at a visit, he said, Brownie, you're doing good work for your people. And we said, oh, we are? <laughs> and he said, you are. And he said, they will come, they will come to Cleveland County. They will come for Earl and they will come for Don. And we were stunned. And so I think the, those of us that worked so hard at the first performances, people were coming in and we didn't know them. And it was wonderful um, that they were coming in and traveling. But nothing could have happened without the wonderful collaboration. The people were in place, the leaders were in place, the commitment, the government. It was truly a citizen-driven, unique public-private partnership with well, two there's, projects. <laughs> there's something to be said for being a dreamer, a mm -hmm. thinker, mm -hmm. and a doer. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to all three of you. 
It's amazing to be here in Shelby, to hear the story of how honoring two native sons has led to the economic revitalization of a city and how that city has supported an entire region because it focused on its own assets, its own cultural assets, its assets that were authentic and unique to this place. There is so much that can be learned from the city of Shelby's story. I hope you all will take time to look up more of it, to understand more of it, to recognize how hard the work is, and yet how incredibly rewarding at the end. Congratulations to Shelby. Thank you. We all share many of the same challenges in our communities, so why not share the solutions as well? Each and every one of us can make a difference. That's what having an impact is all about. NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union and is a public media North Carolina production in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government.